Well, it's not really tales of the year of the church anymore, but it is in its present. I know, we were on that series for so long, people were like, what? Good morning, church. We just want to feel you around us. We want to know your incredible love and your incredible protection and your incredible shelter, Lord. As we sit to listen to you through your word. Father, open our hearts and open our minds. Open our souls, Lord, and spirits. To truly be with you today. In Christ's name. Amen. Every, every week, I pray about, okay, Lord, what do you want me to share? Where do you want me to go? And sometimes that's really quick. Sometimes I know immediately. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes God... Uh, I won't say it's not he delays, it's just me or whatever, but sometimes it's one of those things that I have to wait till almost the very end. And he uses a lot of things to inspire me. One of the things that he has been using recently is music. He's been using various songs and to encourage me, to give me inspiration, to help me understand him better. And one of my favorite Christian artists is probably a guy that you've never heard of before. His name is Marcos Vidal. He is a singer, songwriter, pastor from Madrid, Spain. And I started listening to his music a long time ago. And unfortunately, not a lot of it's in English. And so you're going to have to deal with a rough translation that I've done of of some of his work, but recently I was listening to him and he's got a, a newer song called Cara a Cara, which basically means face to face. And I want to translate that a little bit and, and let you hear this, what he's saying here, because I think it says a lot to what we're talking about and a lot to where we need, what we need to hear. It says this, I don't care where at the table you make me sit or the color of the crown I may win only one word if I still have a voice and can say it in your presence only one request and if it can be in private that's better just let me see you face to face and lose myself as a child in your gaze. And spend a, a lot of time with no one saying anything. Because I'm seeing the Master face to face. Is that your heart, though? Do you want to be in God's presence? In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, our memory verse it says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. To actually experience that, to actually be 
with God. What an amazing day that will be for his children, don't you think? What an amazing day that will be for us to actually be in his presence. And I mean, can you imagine it? Can you imagine all the lies, all the hypocrisy, all the false faces and the false smiles gone? All the judgmental attitudes, all the hatred, all the insecurities, all the worries, gone. Everything we go through in life, all, all the pressures, all the anxieties, all the pain, the discouragement, the feelings of rejection, gone. And we will be fully known. We are already fully known, but I think we will experience that in a way of knowing that we are fully known. And we are knowing Him fully. Not just who we've heard Him to be or who we have been able to, to feel Him to be, but to be in His physical presence. What a day that's going to be. The thing is, we'll be home. What an awesome feeling that will be. You know, countless hymns, countless sermons, essays, writings, etc. have talked about this day. They've looked forward to that, what that's going to be like. I wonder how we'll react. What will it be like? Several years ago, um, a group called Mercy Me wrote a song called I Can Only Imagine. So if you know this song. But if you don't remember it or you're not familiar with it, these are some of the lyrics from it. It says, I can only, and I want you to think about this. Put, your, put yourself there. It says, I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees, will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. The thing is, is we don't know. We've never been there yet. Scripture gives us hints at it of what it's going to be like to be in its presence. But we don't know. But let's take a minute to think about and what Scripture looks at the majesty of His heavenly presence. The majesty of His heavenly presence. Like I said, throughout the Bible, there are glimpses of what God is like and what His throne will be like, etc., and you, you get these pictures of smoke and, and angels and, and multitudes bowing down and, and, and people casting their crowns at His feet and, and holy, holy, holy and all this, this stuff, right? But it's sort of like before you visit another city or another country, you, you may see images on TV or you may have read a book, or you may have heard, but until you're actually there, right? Until you're actually there with the sights and the sounds and the smells and walking the streets and, and feeling the very air, you never really understand. And that's just earth. I can't imagine what it would be like to stand before God to be in his, his awesome holy presence. One thing about it, I imagine it can be terrifying in some ways. I mean, look at Isaiah's vision in six, Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, 
With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I mean, Isaiah, in this vision, he sees that, and I want to unpack this a little bit. First of all, he sees God in a temple, and we don't know if he's envisioning the temple that was in Jerusalem, or if he's envisioning a much larger, a different temple, we're, we're unsure. But it talks about the train of his robe. You know what that is? You know, you see brides going to the up the up the um, up the aisle, and they have this long train behind them, and sometimes it's really long, and people are carrying it, you know, and 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 put it up there for the ceremony. And kings would have these robes on that they would wear, have these long trains as well. But this train fills the temple. You get that idea of the splendor, the majesty, the awesomeness of what is going on. And then it talks about these creatures, these angelic creatures called the seraphim. Now, you know, I don't know, six wings? I, I'm trying to imagine how this all... And there's different pictures... But seraphim, the, what it, it means, and it has different kinds of, of, of meanings in the Hebrew. One, it means like burning ones. And actually, seraph actually translates, it's used in other passages in Scripture, to be like a fiery serpent. Like a, and sometimes a fiery flying serpent. And yet, we also get this image of faces and feet and you know, and others, there's hands and all this kind of stuff. And so, we're going, well, what's going on? And then in other times that you see the idea of lightning, like a serpent would be a lightning. I don't think these guys look like snakes. But I don't think it was one of the, I think it was one of those things that Isaiah is just, he's trying to come up with words. How do you describe something that is so odd, so wild looking, so flashy, so whatever. And these things are obviously worshiping and praising the one who sits in the sun. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy. Whenever you repeat something three times, that holy, holy, holy is an emphasis just trying to tell you, this, this is not just holy, this is holy, holy, holy. This is great, this is wonderful, this is majestic. And something that is interesting, that of all the ancient religions, especially all of those in the Near East, there is no religion where they call their God holy. There is no religion at that time where they called their God holy. Holy. Holy meaning separate. Holy meaning somehow not, not just like us, not with the same, you know, motivations for good and evil. Someone totally separate. Someone totally different. Our God is holy. Our God is awesome. And to be in His presence like that in heaven will be Tremendous. You know, Isaiah, when he has this vision, he has only a brief taste of what that is, right? But you see his reaction. You see how he's looking at this, he's absolutely stunned, he's floored. What? Look at me. In comparison. <clears throat> and it totally changes him, this experience. Later on, you see in Isaiah, he gets his commission, and his life is completely transformed. And if you study the life of Isaiah, you, you see how he did some amazing things for God. He went out on a limb a lot of times for God. 
Because he couldn't do anything less because he can change. He had seen the truth of who God was. And he could never go back to anything else. He had a different perspective. Now when we think of that, that holiness, that, that heavenly presence, I want you to think also, how difficult must it have been for Jesus to leave it? How hard must that have been for Jesus, the Son of God, who was there beforehand to come to earth, to leave that presence, to come down and be born as a baby, to, to, to throw up, to, to have all those biological functions that we just love. All of those different things. How hard must that have been to leave that presence, to leave that glory? Because he knew it from before. We learned in John 17, 4 through 5. He says, I have brought you, when he's praying, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And then he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Before the world began, he was there. He was glorified in God's presence. His Father's presence, and now he is here. How hard it must have been. And as brutal as the cross was, the resurrection, I, I, I have to believe, more than compensated, not only because he was fulfilling his mission, not only because he loved us so much that he was willing to die for us and to offer us a chance of being saved, but it was also the step needed to return to the Father. To get back home. To be back with his father in this awesome presence. This is our hope, isn't it? John 14, 1 through 3. says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And where is he? In the presence of his Father. Now, as wonderful as that day will be one day, and we're looking forward to it as Christians, we're also reminded in Scripture about how awful is the loss of His earthly presence. The loss of His earthly presence. You see, God in a spiritual and somehow physical manifestation sense, we, we don't know heaven. We're right there with Him. But yet also... There's God's earthly presence here. You ever wonder what it was like for Adam? Ever wonder what it was like for Adam to walk with God? It says that God walked in the garden in the pool of the dead. Ever wonder what that would have been like? To walk with the Father in the garden. To be able to commune with God like that. How awful then to be cast out. How awful when your sin separated you from God. To have that relationship damaged, altered, broken. But the thing is, is that our sin may separate us from God. Our sin may cause us to break off that relationship. But God is always pursuing us. He is always coming after us. His whole thing is to restore that relationship. That's been His plan all along. To draw us back. You notice that even though they are cast out of Eden, He still interacts with them. 
He still tries to have a relationship with them. And he has a relationship with their children. We see with Cain and Abel. He's having a relationship. When Cain killed his brother, though, out of anger and out of jealousy, once again, that sin broke away. Broke Cain away from that presence. Look at Genesis 4, 10 through 14, and what he says when he is receiving his punishment. The Lord said, what have you done? This in your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you were driving me from the land, and I will be, say it with me, hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. Now, Cain's reaction here is understandable, definitely about the crops. Because Cain is a farmer. Cain is a farmer, and to suddenly have the farm, the, the ground no longer yield to him because of his sin, to be cursed because of him, that, that would be devastating. Absolutely. And to, to wander is devastating. But there's another thing I think we forget here. Cain is also saying, but I will be hidden from your presence. Because he experienced that. He knew what it was like to be with God. And he understand, he understood the loss. And yet, God reassures him. He's going to put a mark on him, etc. And God continues to be in our lives even when, even when we mess up. But because of the sin, the sin blinds us. It, it keeps us from experiencing him totally. From really understanding His presence. It's not that God can't see us. God sees everything. We, we've learned in Scripture how, how God, you know, no matter where we are, we can go all the way down to the depths of Sheol. God will see us there. We can't hide from Him. But yet we may not be able to sense Him. We may not be able to feel Him. We may be so far away in our spirits that we cannot commune with God. We rightly fear this loss. Look at David in Psalm 51, 11. He says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I mean, because David understands how drastic that is. Our sin blinds us to His presence, His love for us, His will. And our hearts, when this happens, withdraw. Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, These people, they come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And throughout Scripture, we see, especially the children of Israel, time after time again, they, they decide to do their own thing. God tells them one thing, and they decide, no, 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 I'm going to do it this way. Or I'm going to modify it somehow. I, I'm going to decide that I'm going to maybe sort of go in the direction you are saying, but I'm going to twist it somehow. I'm going to follow the form of what you're saying. I'm not going to follow the heart, the intent of what you mean. Do we do that? Do we allow ourselves to, to, to appear holy? To appear like saints? Do we say the right things, supposedly do the right kind of things? 
But we're really not following God, are we? Not in our hearts. I mean, we, we may sing the Psalms. We may quote the Scripture. We may say, praise you, Lord. And it's just words. And when we're alone, in the quiet of our rooms, that relationship's not there. Or maybe in the moment-by-moment -moment decisions, that relationship's not there. Because our attitudes and our actions are driving us further and further away from God. We maintain a form of it, but we lose the power of it. See, by definition, sin is rebellion. It's doing things our way instead of God's way. This was the trap the Pharisees fell into, and it blinded them. Look at Matthew 23, 13 through 33. A long passage, but I need us to see it. Jesus is talking, and he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. When you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne by the one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs, but you look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then, and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you grew the vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Now I said this is a long passage, but I didn't want to take anything out of context. Do you hear what's going on here? Do you, do you sense the seriousness? Of this situation? These are people that are supposedly following God. And yet instead, they follow something that is very much man-made. You and I are in danger of doing this as well. When we play church, 
when we decide that, you know, I'm good enough. I've got the form. I come on Sunday. I come on Wednesday. I, I do soak. I do whatever it may be. And youth on Friday. If that's all it is, it's not enough. Because God wants your heart. He wants you living for Him. Moment by moment. Every single day. Our sin builds walls and He pursues us. And if we let sin win, what does it talk about? What did it say in the end? Cast from His presence, hell, for all goodness, all eternity. Those who decide that all this is is a game and are not following Christ or not having that living relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. It doesn't cut it. It doesn't have to be that way. We do not have to be on this earth lost from His presence. We can experience Him. We can grow in Him. You say, but Pastor John, I can't hear Him oftentimes. As, as it used to say, you know, if you don't have that closeness, who moved? Not God. Us. Because sin, sin is insidious. It's not just, oh, well, I, I don't kill people and, and I don't go out and rob from people and I don't commit adultery. Yeah, we know those. Sin is much trickier than that. Sin is anything that is in rebellion against God. The two greatest commandments, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second one. How many things do we do that go contrary to those? You know, one of the sins that I've been convicted a lot of is the sin of prayerlessness. Of not praying enough and allowing myself to be in His presence. To hear His voice. To be able to follow His direction. That's sin. If I'm not doing all I can through study and meditation to get to know Him more, to live the way He has directed me, that's sin. And it creates a wall. It creates a barrier. And if I keep practicing that, I get further and further and further away from His presence. And I say, I can't hear you. Why? Because I've moved. Oftentimes we feel defeated. We get confused. And it doesn't have to be that way. All we need to do is to really turn back. And that's what the Bible is about. It's about repentance, right? Our turning back. Our leaving that behind and instead embracing the truth we've been given. Embracing Christ. We can live in the joy of His continual presence. You know, I, I read about the lives of the great Christians. I, I read about these, these people who did wonderful things. And yes, they often struggled. They went through hardships. But one of the things I see is that they tapped into something. A secret. The secret was learning how to live in His presence. And I believe, as I get older, that we can do it too. We can live continually in His presence. 
Do I do it always? Absolutely not. Do I want to do it always? Yes. Do I find myself oftentimes struggling and often backsliding and falling out? Yes. But I have learned the secret and that I don't have to stay there. I can turn around and I can come back home. If you feel that you've fallen away, if you feel I can't hear God, come back home. Turn around. Examine your life. See, what is it? What is the blockage that is keeping me from being in His presence? Because being in His presence is a moment-by-moment -moment thing of where you are asking God, what is the direction of my life? It's sort of like taking this phone, a spiritual phone, and leaving it on so that you're always here. You're always there. You always know what he's saying. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a spiritual discipline. And discipline takes work. But when we fail... We need to have the discipline to get back up and seek. James 4.8 says this. It says, draw near to God. What? We draw near to you. It's a promise for us. If we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. That experience of His presence will be there. But we have to draw near. And we do this through prayer and obedience. And what happens then? We experience the joy. Psalm 16, 5 through 11 says this. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with what? Joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And we can live in His blessings and His grace. Psalm 89, 15 through 16. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. This is doable. It's hard. It requires constant discipline. It requires us to constantly turn our minds, our thoughts toward Him. To not try to do it on our own. To not try to solve our problems by ourselves. To not decide we can go our own way because we know best. But instead to let Him be the guide. Are you experiencing His presence in your life? Are you passionless? Are you confused? Turn to Him daily. And live. Because that's what He's called us, right? He's called us to live life. To enjoy life with Him. You know, I, we started out with a Marcus Gudel song, Kara Kara. But over 20 years ago, he wrote another song that has been a song that probably my favorite by him. It's called Suyo Nanamats. And I, once again, I've roughly translated it for you. But I want us to end on this. 
because it's a call for us. And it goes like this. It says, it is not just an ordinary day today. It's a day of commitment and decision. Choose today whom you will serve. Yes to the idols or to a real God. Because today is not just any day. You've already watched enough as a spectator. But now you decide whether to walk in the shadow of your darkness or be a child of the light. I have chosen the joy of being his. Nothing more. I do not care what others choose. He gave me new hope. He filled my loneliness. In Jesus, I received life and true freedom. I have chosen the joy. I have chosen the audacious challenge of being His. Nothing more. <clears throat> Don't put off for tomorrow what is up today. You never know if there will be another chance. You only serve one master. You cannot split your heart. No, it's not just an ordinary day today. Every hour that passes, you have less time. I don't know where your heart is today. Maybe it's grown cold. Or maybe it's a heart that has been seeking God. It's been asking, where are you? And he's given you the answer. He says, I'm right here. But all you have to do is accept. All you have to do is believe. And I will come and fill you and change your life forever. We're not going to have just a regular invitation. But what we are going to do instead is, if this is you, and you just need someone to pray with you, if you need someone to talk about it, I want to be available for you. Others in here, Dana, Scott, Jessica, others, Joshua, love to be able to talk with you, pray with you, and help you see the truth. Because we all need each other. And we all struggle. That's normal. But God has given us a body in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence in your church. In your body of believers. Thank you, Lord, that even though we have sinned, you didn't abandon us, but you continue to call us back because you love us. Like a father who loves a child, you want us to come home. So, Lord, I, I pray for any here who is struggling. I pray for any here who have decided to go their own way. But you're calling them home. And I pray that they will take those steps to return to you. For those of us, Lord, who are trying, but oftentimes we stumble, Lord, keep our faith and our feet sure. Help us moment by moment to follow your path. And for those, Lord, who maybe have never chosen, who have never followed Jesus Christ, Lord, this, this can be their day. And so, Lord, I pray that they will not put it off any longer, that they will choose to follow you. Thank you, Lord, for your tremendous, awesome love. And that you want to have us always in your presence. In Christ's name.